Okay, uh, let's pray first. Please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for another Sabbath day. Thank you so much for that message and song, Lord, that um, about your love for each one of us. Um, I pray, Lord, that you be with us now um, as we uh, begin to study some more about you and your love. And I pray that you'll open our hearts, our minds and our hearts to receive uh, the message that you have for us today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay, so <laughs> I, I guess for the last couple of weeks, I've been uh, impressed to study uh, forgiveness. And so we're just going to kind of go through like a little study on forgiveness. Um, so I just did mention that I've been studying it recently, but just a little disclaimer that though I've been doing like a bit of research on this topic, that I'm still like the least qualified person to speak concerning its application. I do, however, find myself quite well versed in receiving its benefits though. So, so the, this first um, quotation is one that I found. It's not a spirit of prophecy quotation. It was actually written by uh, Joseph Wagner, and I believe it was in, it's, the article is called The Power of Forgiveness. Okay, so one of the most common expressions to be heard among professed Christians when speaking of religious things is this. I can understand and believe that God will forgive sin, but it is hard for me to believe that he can keep me from sin. Such a person has yet to learn very much of what is meant by God's forgiving sins. It is true that persons who talk that way do often have a measure of peace in believing that God has forgiven or does forgive their sins, but through failure to grasp the power of forgiveness, they deprive themselves of much blessing that they might enjoy. So I know that for myself, um, I haven't always understood forgiveness, and at least trying to understand it has made my life a whole lot better. At least my understanding of God a lot clearer. So we're just going to read through the scripture reading one more time, and it's Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 25. So if you can turn your Bible, say with me, please. Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. So then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. And so when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. And his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgive thee all that debt, because thou desiredest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses." Okay, so sorry, the first lesson, um, well, actually, Christ's Object Lessons, there's a chapter in it, uh, The Measure of Forgiveness, and I think that it's amazing that uh, God has used uh, Ellen White and has provided us with the spirit of prophecy to better understand passages in the Bible. So in Christ's Object Lessons, I don't remember the number, but the chapter is called The Measure of Forgiveness, and the first lesson that is explained from this parable is... Um, the pardon granted by this king represents a divine forgiveness of all sin. Christ is represented by the king 
who, moved with compassion, forgave the debt of his servant. Man was under the condemnation of the broken law. He could not save himself, and for this reason, Christ came to this world, clothed with divinity, with humanity, and gave his life, the just for the unjust. Okay. And he gave himself for our sins, and to every soul he freely offers the blood-bought pardon. With the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And that can be found in Psalms 130, verse 7. Here is the ground upon which we should exercise compassion toward our fellow sinners. If God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. John 4, verse 11. Freely ye have received, Christ says, freely give. Matthew 10, verse 8. The second lesson that we can learn as well is when the debtor, when the debtor pleaded with his Lord for mercy, he had no true sense of the greatness of his debt. He did not realize his helplessness. He hoped to deliver himself. Have patience with me, he said, and I will pay thee all. So there are many who hope by their own works to merit God's favor. They do not realize their helplessness. They do not accept the grace of God as a free gift, but are trying to build themselves up in self-righteousness. Their own hearts are not broken and humbled on account of sin and they are exacting and unforgiving towards others. Their own sins against God, compared with their brother's sins against them, are as 10,000 talents to 100 pence, nearly one million to one, yet they dare to be unforgiving. And so there's a chapter also in uh, Steps to Christ, and it's, I think it's the second chapter, and it's about the sinner's need of Christ. And it kind of like outline, outlines the difference, um, I guess, between true forgiveness and or at least what i think so um when we're not genuine we can have remorse for suffering or the pain that would be caused as our, as our consequence as opposed to remorse for the actual sin itself so the third lesson is god's forgiveness toward us lessens in no wise our duty to obey him so the spirit of forgiveness toward our fellow men does not lessen the claim of just obligation. In the prayer which Christ taught his disciples, he said, Forgive us not our debts as we forgive our debtors. Matthew 6, verse 12. By this, he did not mean that in order to be forgiven our sins, we must not require our just dues from our de debtors. Sorry. If they cannot pay, even though this may be the result of unwise management, they are not to be cast into prison, oppressed, or even treated harshly. But the parable does not teach us to encourage indolence. The word of God declares that if a man will not work, neither shall he eat. The Lord does not require the hardworking man to support others in idleness. With many, there is a waste of time, a lack of effort, which brings to poverty and want. If these faults are not corrected by those who indulge them, all that might be done in their behalf would be like putting treasure into a bag with holes. Yet there is an unavoidable poverty, and we are to manifest tenderness and compassion toward those who are unfortunate. We should treat others just as we ourselves, in like circumstances, would wish to be treated. And so the fourth lesson, which is a lesson that I actually didn't really understand at all, which I need to like start putting into practice, is... Um, but sin is not to be lightly regarded. The Lord has commanded us not to suffer wrong upon our brother. He says, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. Luke 17, verse 3. Sin is to be called by its right name and is to be plainly laid out before the wrongdoer. So uh, I guess forgiveness is not passive. So if you see somebody sinning, then you're supposed to tell them, not watch them suffer, right? Um, and forgiveness is a demonstration of God's love. So like I said before, so instead of seeing someone stuck in sin and just passing it by, uh, it's Christ-like to help them out and to point out their sin. So this path is not competitive. Sorry. Oh. This path is not competitive, but everyone is working to help each other. And then I think of, uh, there was a, I guess it's a vision by Ellen White, I'm not sure, but it's about like the night train vision. And so she saw a train that was passing by with um, most of the world on the train. And then there, like she, like the, anyways, the person driving the train was Satan. 
but they like he looked like really pretty like all well put together but people didn't notice on the train and then she kind of got like sad and then the angel told her to look the other way and she saw um a few people like together like walking on a path with the light like a smaller path with the light so they were helping each other right so we're supposed to help each other on this journey to heaven so the next lesson is uh well, I guess the main one. But the great lesson of the parable lies in contrast between God's compassion and man's hard-heartedness in the fact that God's forgiving mercy is to be the measure of our own. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? We are not forgiven because we forgive, but as we forgive. The ground of all forgiveness is found in the unmerited love of God. But by our attitude toward others, we show whether we have made that love our own. Wherefore, Christ says, with with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Matthew 7, verse 2. So what does true forgiveness look like? So it can look like, well, it looks like long-suffering. So the very essence of long-suffering is suffering. It requires a relinquishing of your own comfort, desires, and satisfaction in order to extend grace and forbearance to another. It requires each to esteem each other better than themselves, and it compels forgiveness, offering the other cheek, trusting God's justice and judgment, and it, quite frankly, is nearly impossible to exercise without the mind of Christ. So, and then I found another quotation, and it's um, an article called The Duty of Forgiveness, and this is written by uh, Ellen White, and it was published in 1886 in the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, and it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It is the most difficult, even for those who claim to be followers, followers of Jesus, to forgive as Christ forgives us. The true spirit of forgiveness is so little practiced and so many interpretations are placed upon Christ's requirement that its force and beauty are lost sight of. We have very uncertain views of the great mercy and loving kindness of God. He is full of compassion and forgiveness and freely pardons when we truly repent and confess our sins. I just have a question for everyone. So in the Bible, or at least can you like just, I guess, raise your voice and just shout out, um, where in the Bible do we learn that God is long-suffering? Yes. Should we read it? Yeah, we can read it. Okay, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse... Oh, 2 Peter 3, 9. So the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us ward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Any more? Well, I found a few too. Uh, Numbers 14, verse 18, it says, The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. And another one, Isaiah 55, verse 7, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And another one, so Ezekiel 33, verse 11, Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? And I'm pretty sure there's tons more (laughs) that I didn't say, but from the Bible we know that God is long-suffering. Okay, so I have some more questions. So how can, what kind of attitude do we need to have to be forgiven. Have to be genuine. Humble. Yes. Yes. And we need to have a broken and contrite spirit, right? Right. And a true remorse for sin and not for the suffering, which would allow us to have repentance. And re- repentance is a true revival and reformation. Right, so acknowledging the sin, having sorrow, sorrow from it, and actually changing your ways, um, yeah. So you don't sin anymore. 
So as a result, or what does forgiveness result from? Who is prompting forgiveness? Yes, the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. And who is eligible to receive forgiveness? Yes, everyone has access. And when are we forgiven? Yes, when we ask. And when, our, our, when are our sins blotted out? Are they blotted out the same time that we ask? No, they're not, actually. Yes. <laughs> We're forgiven, but our, one thing that I just, I, well, I, I learned this maybe like a couple months ago. I didn't know this. I just always seemed, I guess, when I just listened to like different presentations that like as soon as I ask for forgiveness, like my sin is like wiped out clean, like it's not there anymore. But the truth is that it's there. And that's what Jesus is doing in the most holy place of the sanctuary to blot out our sins, right? The investigative judgment. Yes? Okay. And so another fascinating finding that I found that I'll share with you guys Okay, but the gist of it, I don't have the quotation because it's just lower. It's in Desire of Ages. And it just says that when we sin, that God doesn't see us. He sees Christ in us, which I thought was, like, really profound. Um, yeah, so he doesn't see just plain me when I sin. He sees beyond that, like, what his ideal was for me to become. Yeah. Okay. So as I'm studying, still going, I was like, is retribution biblical? At first, I didn't know what retribution was. So retribution is a punishment inflicted on someone as vengeance for a wrong or criminal act. And so um, I was taken to Romans chapter 12, verses 19 and 20. And it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. So is, is retribution what goes around, comes around? Is are they like the same thing? Yeah, kind of. But it's a little bit different, I think, like when, at least my understanding of it. Before, it was kind of like... Um, what goes around comes around. If you do wrong to me, I'm going to make sure that something bad happens to you, right? No, that's not biblical retribution. So biblical retribution is um, I'm going to love you and treat you as Christ wants me to treat you, reflect his character to you, and then God will deal with it afterwards. You know, he'll deal with everything else, okay? So why is forgiveness relevant was my next question. Uh, what does forgiveness have to do with me? And th is that all that there is to forgiveness or am I missing something? And recently I kind of had a, well, I had a conflict with a friend and I kind of like, I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, so I just, I just went to my, in my Bible in the concordance and it took me, I went to, I searched enemy, so different Bible verses on enemy, and I went to, well, one of the verses that it took me to was Psalms 55, verses 12 to 14, and it says, for it was not an enemy that reproached me, then I could have borne it, neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him, but it was thou, a man mine equal." my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the, we walked unto the house of God in company. So I read that and I was like, oh, wow, praise the Lord. Like God actually understands what I'm going through right now, right? Because we can think about God and what happened to him in heaven with Lucifer, right? We think of Jesus, what happened to Judith. Like usually the people that hurt you the most are the people that are closest to you, right? But that doesn't necessarily give us a reason to react any particular way, which we'll talk about right now. And so another reason, I guess, why uh, forgiveness is relevant to me is to understand the great controversy that we live in right now. So the great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly 6,000 years is soon to close. And the wicked one redoubles his efforts to defeat the work of Christ in man's behalf and to fasten souls in his snares to hold the people in darkness and impenitence till the Savior's mediation is ended and there is no longer a sacrifice for sin is the object which he seeks to accomplish. 
So from the very beginning, uh, Satan has worked to distort God's character of love and justice. And when man, when man fell, Satan gained dominion over the earth. And it's because of Christ's sacrifice and the plan of redemption to restore what to restore that which was lost so that the image of God's perfect character can be replicated now um, and that we have a pattern. <laughs> and redemption didn't stop at the cross. We all have a part to play in the plan of redemption along with all of heaven and with angels. So that was like the first one, and I'll keep reading. It is the greatest and most... Oh, hold on, sorry. <laughs> um, I went too fast there. Oh, I'm missing it. Okay, so I will just say this, as I, as I said before, Satan. Um, it was Satan's, it's Satan's plan right now to distort God's character and love. Character of love and justice for us. So Satan will do anything that he can to try to shake us up or try to change different, like just to, I guess, give us different challenges and hassles and for us to be in our situation to look at God and to say that he is something than what he's not, something other than what he's not. Um, and so I was thinking about this and it like helped me to understand, I guess, change my perspective about things or the way I looked at things. And so I came across another quotation, and it says, it is the greatest and most fatal deception to suppose that a man can have faith unto life eternal without possessing Christ-like love for his brethren. He who loves God and his neighbor is filled with light and love. God is in him and all around him. Christians love those around them as precious souls for whom Christ has died. There is no such thing as a loveless Christian for God is love, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So um, it is the greatest and most fatal deception to believe that you can go to heaven without having brotherly love, without loving each person the way that Christ loves each person. So it continues in Christ. Christ's object lessons, but if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Nothing can justify an unforgiving spirit. He who is unmerciful towards others shows that he himself is not a partaker of God's pardoning grace. In God's forgiveness, the heart of the erring one is drawn close to the great heart of infinite love. The tide of divine compassion flows into the sinner's soul and from him to the souls of others." The tenderness and mercy that Christ has revealed in his own precious life will be seen in those who become sharers of his grace. So not sometimes or maybe or between business hours, nine to five, Monday to Friday, but they will be seen all the time in those who become sharers of his grace. But if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, Romans 8 verse 9. He is alienated from God, fitted only for eternal separation from him. It is true that he may once have received forgiveness, but his unmerciful spirit shows that he now rejects God's pardoning love. He has separated himself from God and is in the same condition as he was before he was forgiven. He has denied his repentance and his sins are upon him as if he had not repented. So I guess my main point is that it is our duty to forgive. As partakers of God's grace, as claiming um, God's forgiveness for ourselves from our sins and being able to be used by him today, it is our duty to forgive others, to reflect Christ's characters, to reflect Christ's character with all those that we come in contact with. Like it's not, for me, I, I learn, I'm learning that forgiveness is not an option or something to consider. Like it's just something that I have to do. But when the message of God's pardoning love comes from a heart that has an experimental knowledge thereof, to those who have not experienced it for themselves, it is like speaking in parables. We must bring into our characters the love and sympathy expressed in Christ's life. To me, that spoke, spoke volume. So if I, like, forgiveness can even be a way of witnessing, if I want to call it that. So for, for someone like me, I guess, who has an experimental knowledge and, 
let's say I go to the grocery store and somebody like takes my parking spot, um, I don't know, and they start yelling at me or whatever, and I just tell them like, you know, it's okay, I forgive you, in that, maybe that they can see Christ, something different in me, and that might, they'll be able to see, or almost like as if they would read a book, but they could see Christ's love through that, like through our actions. So trials and challenges. And again, I think as I was like reading through the, or at least going through my study, I kind of wondered like, why do these things have to happen? And so I found a few answers. There's a lot more than these three that I'll share with you. So the first one, it says, the followers of Christ know little of the plots which Satan and his hosts are forming against them. But he who sitteth in the heavens will overrule all these devices for the accomplishment of his deep designs. The Lord permits his people to be subjected to the fiery ordeal of temptation, not because he takes pleasure in the distress and affliction, but because this process is essential to their final victory. He could not, consistently with his own glory, shield them from temptation, for the very object of the trial is to prepare them to resist all the allurements of evil. The second one, not in freedom from trial, but in the midst of it, is Christian character developed. Exposure to rebuffs and opposition leads the follower of Christ to greater watchfulness and more earnest prayer to the mighty helper. Severe trial endured by the grace of God develops patience, vigilance, fortitude, and a deep abiding trust in God. It is the triumph of the Christian faith that it enables its followers to suffer and to be strong, to submit and thus to conquer, to be killed all the day long and yet to live, to bear the cross and thus to win the crown of glory. And the last one that I found was, when trials arise that seem unexplainable, we should not allow our peace to be spoiled. However unjustly we may be treated, let not passion arise. By indulging a spirit of retaliation, we injure ourselves. We destroy our own confidence in God and grieve the Holy Spirit. There is by our side a witness, a heavenly messenger, who will lift up for us a standard against the enemy. He will shut us in with the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. Beyond this, Satan cannot penetrate. He cannot pass the shield of holy light. Okay, so that's your story. So a few weeks ago, well, I guess probably more like months now, but during the summer, I had the opportunity to go on a mission trip. And what I was initially asked to do changed. Well, I guess some of you might, well, I didn't share this. I shared my experience going on a mission trip well, really short, well, last month at AY, and there was another experience that I didn't really think too much of it, but I think it kind of helped, it really helped in my understanding of understanding forgiveness. Um, So I went on a mission trip, and what I was initially asked to do, it changed like two days before, so I felt really overwhelmed, or I should say a little discouraged, because I felt like I wasn't qualified to do what I was asked to do and that was uh, to do uh, like health education so let's say like I did cooking classes and showing demonstrating how to cook healthy plant-based food (laughs) so uh, prior to the trip like we had to do a lot of uh, I guess submit a lot of proposals and different things like that and we well at least for me personally I thought I got like quite a bit of opposition like, there was always something in the proposal that I wrote that needed to be changed, so I kept getting sent back to, sent, it kept being resent to me that I need to make edits and changes, but I didn't make all the changes because I felt like they really needed to be there. Um, and so, once we had gotten to the place where we did the mission trip, which was in northern Ontario, in a First Nations reserve called Bearskin Lake, uh, the local church um, that helped to sponsor the trip as well as um, another organization. They were there and they were representatives. And there was a a gentleman there and uh, he was elder of the church and he also like was like a practicing physician. And I just say his, I guess his background a little bit just to show, I guess the level of respect that he had, I guess from other people, how it, I don't know, people looked at, respected him a lot. So, we, well, the volunteers, we kind of sat like in a half round circle and he was sitting like directly in front. And so I'm pretty slow. So like maybe like 
15 minutes into the talk, like he was pretty much like talking to each person, like going around the circle to talk about their contribution to the project and what he wanted, what his goals were for the project. And so I was kind of bracing myself because I know he had been giving me hassles like this whole entire time. And so um, it got to be, it was my turn. <laughs> and so he looked at me and then he just started like, I don't know, he just, it was just really discouraging. So a lot of the things that I was thinking before, like he started to say. And then I wasn't really sure what to do. A part of me was like, okay, like I need to argue back. I need to say this, this, and this. He's wrong. Like this is not fair at all. And then I prayed and then I remembered that like uh, a gentle response is not likely to like induce wrath. You guys know that Bible verse kind of thing like that. And then, um, so he didn't stop there. Like he actually like looked at me and he started to talk about different things. I guess that I was like, or that I had struggled with before. So I kind of looked at him and I was like, this is strange. This is actually a little creepy because <laughs> he was talking about things that I didn't even tell, like things that like these people that I had met like just this week, like things that I wouldn't share with people. Like these are things like from before, like all discouraging things, right? And I wasn't really sure like what to make out of it. Like it actually made me really sad, but it was like really creepy because I was also thinking too that like I've never met this guy before. This is the first time that I've met him. He doesn't know anything about me. How is he telling me all these things? Especially not even stuff about the mission ship, but like everything else, right? And so I wasn't too sure. I remember I told I shared the shared what happened with my mom, but I was kind of praying and asking God to make it clearer to me to understand like what that was per se. And I guess I didn't have enough reason to even be mad at him because I didn't tell you anything. So why would he, why would, how on earth would he find out? Like there, I have no reason to be upset with him. And so I came back from the mission and the following week was practical skills camp. Yay! So at practical skills camp, uh, one of the mornings, like praise the Lord for morning manna. I think the Holy Spirit was definitely working there and like, really helped answer my question. So one of the mornings, well, <laughs> so one of the mornings we were talking about, well, Christ, the closing scenes of Christ's life, right? And uh, just that, like, the mob, like, the different people that were there, like, the soldiers, like, Satan was using them as agents, right? So, Praise the Lord, my question was answered. So I just kind of stepped away with the understanding that, uh, that we can either be used by God, Holy Spirit, or we can be used by Satan. We can't be used by both at the same time, one or the other. And that um, when we don't consecrate our lives to God for us to be used by the Holy Spirit, that we can actually be an agent of Satan to somebody else without even realizing it or understanding that. So that definitely helped me to remind me that um, I need to be very careful with what I say and to consecrate myself to God, the Holy Spirit, all the time, right? To be on guard so that I can be used only and solely by the Holy Spirit. And so with that in mind, like, we're thinking back that I... When we think about like just the great controversy, it kind of just, it makes it a lot easier to forgive because it wasn't necessarily the guy or the doctor that I should have been mad at. It was really Satan. Like he didn't really have anything to do with it. I think he called it like the, the double veil. So it's not actually the person, it's the person behind the person. So don't get mad at people. Like think about the great controversy and who's influencing that person. Right? So that definitely helped with my understanding of forgiveness. Yeah, and then the Bible verse with that is Ephesians 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So how do you know what is of the Holy Spirit and what is not? Um, and I don't think I fully answered this question, but someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that um, we know a lot, the Bible tells us a lot about uh, Christ's character, and so we can know if the Holy Spirit, if it 
abides with that or if it follows that pattern that we can see through Christ's life. So I'll give you an example. So in this uh, excerpt is taken from Steps to Christ on God's love for man. And it says that Jesus did not suppress one word of truth, but he uttered it always in love. He exercised the greatest tact and thoughtful kind attention in his intercourse with the people. He was never rude, never needlessly spoke a severe word, never gave needless pain to a sensitive soul. He did not censure human weakness. He spoke the truth, but always in love. He denounced hypocrisy, unbelief, and iniquity, but tears were in his voice as he uttered his scathing rebukes. He wept over Jerusalem, the city he loved, which refused to receive him the way, the truth, and the life. They had rejected him, the Savior, but he regarded them with pitying tenderness. His life was one of self-denial and thoughtful care for others. Every soul was precious in his eyes. Sorry, last one. While he never bore himself with divine dignity, he bowed with the tenderest regard to every member of the family of God. In all men, he saw fallen souls whom it was his mission to save. So just from that like excerpt, I just learning also that when, um, I guess I should say this first, that when we're corrected, it's not necessarily always from Satan, that being corrected is good, but we can know that we're being corrected by the way that it's done and the words that are spoken, the way how it's done, and we can look to Christ as that example. Okay, so such is the character of Christ as revealed in his life. This is the character of God. It is from the Father's heart that the streams of divine compassion manifest in Christ. They flow out to the children of men Jesus, the tender, pitying Savior, was God manifested in the flesh. So the character or the way that Christ behaved on earth, he was reflecting God's character. Okay, and another story. I think this is the last story. So uh, I'm just going to share with you guys a little bit, I guess, as to why. I'll show you the whole story. What am I saying? So just a little bit of, like, my understanding of forgiveness and the story, it's kind of, I guess, the wrong way how I forgave. So when I was, it was 2016, and I took a leadership class. So I actually am a graduate of Berman University, and I took a leadership class. And one of the practical components of the class was that I had to do a camping solo. And it wasn't, like, intense. I had a tent. I had food. And I, and I was supposed to bring the Bible and nothing else to read or to look at or anything. So I was dropped off on Friday, and I, was, and I was picked up on Monday. I knew it was going to be picked up on Monday. And on Friday, I just kind of set everything up, and then um, I welcomed the Sabbath to the best of my understanding, and then I went to sleep. So on Sabbath, I really was bored because I didn't have anything to do and nobody to talk to. So I opened my Bible. I was just kind of flipping through, and... I went to Matthew chapter 18, verse 21 to 35. <laughs> and I didn't know it then, but I was reading it and I was like, oh, wow. Like, and I think I read it like two or three times and then I stopped and I was like, <laughs> am I the wicked servant? I don't want to read this anymore. So I closed the Bible, which you shouldn't do. And I actually learned this again, like actually recently, like a few weeks ago. Like don't procrastinate. Um, just a little aside from the story, so I'll go back to the story really soon. But um, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. So Hebrews 4, verse 17. And Spirit of Prophecy says, it is unsafe to delay obedience. You may never hear that invitation again. So if God is asking you to do something or like you feel convicted by something in the Bible, do it, please. <laughs> do it. So, um yeah, so I, I read it, and I closed the Bible, and I put it away. But for the rest of the day, I felt really uncomfortable. I felt really nauseous, had a headache. I couldn't sleep at all Sabbath, um, Saturday night at all. And the reason was because I felt that I was the wicked servant because I, I knew of one person in my life who I had not forgiven, and that person was my father. 
So if you don't, well, I'll just give you a little of this. Well, a little bit about me that I was raised by a single parent and I guess I've always had like negative feelings about my dad just because he's never been there. So just absence, it's not there. Um, so yeah, I started to, I was starting at that time in 2016, I was starting to study for myself and understand that Christ had done a lot for me. And so I saw myself as a wicked servant because I just wouldn't forgive him for not being there after all that Christ had done for me. So I finally like accepted it and I was like, okay, when I get back to school on Monday, I'm just going to like find his contact and I'm going to tell him that I forgive him. And immediately like the feeling went away and I felt so much better. Okay. But when I went back to school on Monday, I didn't do it. <laughs> and I tell you guys, I'm like really not, I'm not proud of myself for saying this, but it took me nine months to actually talk to him. And this was in April. I never actually ended up talking to him until October, November um, of that same year. And so right after I had done that class, it was the end of the semester, and I planned to go on a mission trip to Swaziland. So looking back now, I can definitely say God is so good for providing for me, despite I wasn't doing what I told him I was going to do. Um, and so he made a way for me to go to Swaziland, Africa, and we went uh, with an organization that... Uh, takes care of orphanages for the children. So we did uh, lots of health clinics, um, health education seminars, and we also like just played with the children and we did a construction project to help like enlarge and make their space more usable and more functional for the children. And so while I was there, there were three like little girls that like stuck to me like glue. <laughs> and there's a picture of them up there. It might not be the clearest picture, but I, I actually don't remember their names but they like were so close to me. And uh, one Friday, I think it was actually the last Friday that I was there. And I should probably tell you guys this too, that before I went on the trip, I remembered that I hadn't, like right before I was gonna go on the plane, like I remembered that I hadn't spoken to my dad yet. So I was like, okay, God, I know I'm no, I'm so sorry, but as soon as I come back, I'll do it, <laughs> right? So then it just kind of like, left my mind and have to deal with it. So that Friday, when I was, that's, there was the last Friday that we were in Swaziland, we were supposed to be doing a, like a first aid certification course for the staff that were there. And I wasn't able to do it because I felt really cold. I wasn't feeling well. It just wasn't like sickness, sickness, but I just was feeling really cold. So I asked for excuse and I went out outside and just sat in the sun. And I was sitting there, I was probably lying there for like an hour or so. And then, look who comes to visit me, my friends, my three friends who always come to find me because they couldn't find me inside. So they came outside to find me and they were like digging in my backpack and everything. And, and then they pulled out like a Ziploc bag full of pictures. And so before going on the mission trip, my professors uh, recommended that we all take pictures so that when we're talking to the children and because there's a language barrier, it's easier for them to understand what you're saying when you have pictures. So one of the pictures that I had was of my family. And so, uh, of course, the questions were coming. I was like, oh, no, this is the worst. I want to disappear. <laughs> and uh, they were like, so who is this? So I was pointing to them. I was like, that's my mom. That's my brother. That's my sister. That's my brother. And that's my sister. And they were like, so where's your dad? And then I was like, uh, he's just not in the picture. <laughs> So where was he? Is he sick? Like, is he still alive? And I was like, no, he's alive. He's like, really? So, and I explained to them that I was raised like in a single parent home and they were like shocked. Like they couldn't believe it. And like, they gave me a hug and they were like, wow, like you're a single orphan too. And so <laughs> a single orphan in the sense that like, at least in the orphanages, there was single orphans and there was double orphans. So if you're a single orphan, if you lost one parent and you were a double orphan, if you didn't have any parents. So they saw me as a single orphan, right? So I was like, okay. And then they were like, but like, you're technically not a full single orphan because your dad is still alive and you can talk to him. So they made me promise that I talked to him, right? And I was like, this is ridiculous. Like, how did I have this conversation all the way in Africa with like children that are not even 12? This doesn't make any sense. So yeah, that was definitely, I believe, a reminder, like the Holy Spirit reminding me to do this. But of course, this was in May 
<laughs> and I didn't do it when I went back. <laughs> but I did tell my professor, and he did pray with me, and he kind of kept me accountable. So I started off by, like, writing a letter. And then I was like, I'm just going to do an email. And by this time, I'd already had my dad's contact information, so it wasn't that difficult to. It just a matter of actually doing it. So when I went back to school, I sat through a presentation, uh, which my professor actually told me that I needed to go and write a report on it. But I think he knew more, more than I was actually anticipating. I had no idea what the, the lecture was about. And so this lady here in the picture, her name is uh, Katie Hutchinson. And this was a case, um, or her story was really popular, like 1997, 1998. Uh, but I had no idea who she was. And so in, on December 31st of 1997, her and her husband uh, put their two children to sleep. And they were going to enjoy like New Year's. Uh, but their friends who lived down the road had gone away on vacation, but they had left their teenage son in the house. So the husband had decided that, you know, before I come back and relax, I'm just going to go over to make sure that, you know, the son is okay. And if he wants to come over, he can come over and like stay with us, right? And so she said bye to her husband. Her husband went to the house and it turned out, unfortunately, that he was murdered while he went to the house. Uh, the teenager had a house party. And so they were under the influence of drugs and alcohol. And there was like a fight that broke out and they ended up murdering him. Okay. And so uh, for four years, she was like pleading or like sharing her story over the news. And uh, no one had come forward until four years later. Uh, it's, uh, or the person that had done it, his name was Ryan. And he's right there, like in the picture next to her. And so together they share their story of, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with it, it's called restorative justice. So instead of, it's a different kind of justice in that like, you still, you still serve the consequence for the act that you committed, but you're trying to build, you're both trying to help each other like uh, overcome the trauma or the experience, so to build like a relationship with each other. So they actually, she, well, she, you can read it online, like, and she did share it. It just was really difficult for her to understand how to try to love someone who murdered someone that she loved so much, right? And so actually from the picture, you can see they've actually become like mother and son in their relationship, which is really interesting. And they, I, I think she's a Christian. I'm not sure exactly um, what, but that was really eye-opening for me, going to that lecture. And so when they travel, they, ask, they often ask questions, does forgiving mean giving up your right to justice, and does it mean that what they did is right? So those are just two questions, okay? Um, and Ryan said this at the, end of his, at the end of the presentation. So I'll read it to you. It says, the big question I still ask myself is, why did you do this? And I still can't find an answer. Doing time is easy compared to the guilt I'll have to live with for the rest of my life. But with Katie's forgiveness, I hope that perhaps one day I'll be able to forgive myself. Okay, and I know you can think a lot of things right now. <laughs> but the one point that I wanted to go forward with, which it actually talks about it at the end, closer to the end of the chapter in uh, Christ Object Lessons, measure forgiveness uh, and it says when they come to you so they as in the person that wronged you comes to you with confession you should not say I do not think they are humble enough I do not think they feel their confession what right have you to judge them as if you could read the heart the word of God says if he repent forgive him and if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day turn again to thee saying I repent thou shalt forgive him. Luke 17, verse 3 and 4. And not only seven times, but 70 times seven, just as often as God forgives you. So we ourselves owe everything to God's free grace. Grace in the covenant ordained our adoption. Grace in the Savior affected our redemption, our regeneration, and our exaltation to heirship with Christ. Let this grace be revealed to others. Give the erring one 
no occasion for discouragement. Suffer not a physical hardness to come in and hurt your brother. Let no bitter sneer rise in mind or heart. Let no tinge of scorn be manifest in the voice. If you speak a word of your own, if you take an attitude of indifference or show suspicion or distrust, it may prove the ruin of a soul. And he needs a brother with the elder brother's heart of sympathy to teach his heart of humanity. Let him feel the strong clasp of a sympathizing hand and hear the whisper, let us pray. God will give you a rich experience to you both. Prayer unites us with one another and with God. Prayer brings Jesus to our side and gives to the fainting, perplexed soul new strength to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Prayer turns upside down. Prayer turns aside the attacks of Satan. When one turns away from human imperfections to behold Jesus, a divine transformation takes place in the character. The spirit of Christ working upon the heart conforms to his image. Then let it be your effort to lift up Jesus. Let the mind's eye be directed to the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, John 1, verse 29. And as you engage in this work, remember that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins, James 5, verse 20. Okay, so please remind me to finish the story. Okay, <laughs> I didn't finish my story yet. Okay, so after, so... Right after uh, that, that, that seminar, I guess I call it a seminar that I went to when I was at school with Katie Hutchinson and Ryan, uh, I had to go home now and write my report. So I was writing the report and I just kind of like broke down. I was like, okay, I just have to do it now. So I picked up the phone and I called and I'm probably gonna say it was like the most awkward thing that I think I've ever done in my life. And the conversation was only two minutes, but it actually went really well. And I actually felt a lot better afterwards. Uh, one problem, though, that is that um, I don't think I fully understood forgiveness, or I don't even think I fully understand it now, but I didn't understand it as much as I did then as I do today, if that makes any sense. So on social media, um, I see a lot of these like little blurb things. So one of them that I saw, it says, I forgive people, but that doesn't mean I accept their behavior or trust them. I, give, I forgive them for me so that I can let go and move on with my life. And I was like, well, I tried that. So that's what I tried like in the beginning. And uh, let's just say my relationship with my dad hasn't been like the best. At least I thought it would just kind of grow and that we would get to know each other. And then like, yeah, it'd just be kind of normal, at least as normal as could be. But the reality is that it hasn't been. <laughs> and so doing it to, or at least having the motive of just moving on with my life didn't work. So, uh, yeah, it didn't work. Uh, what were they saying? So having the motive of just moving on with my life, like this quote says, didn't work. And quickly, it also mentioned that again, it, uh, Christ object lessons. He whose heart is fixed to serve God. No, I think I'm not supposed to read that one. No, I'm not supposed to read that one. Not yet. <laughs> I just need to finish the story. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I'll just read it one more time so that I can try to remember what I'm supposed to say. So I forgive people, but that doesn't mean I accept their behavior or trust them. I forgive them for me so that I can let go and move on with my life. So having that as the, the main, my main motive in talking to my dad or like kind of like telling people, oh yeah, like I forgive my dad and I feel so much better and I like, I can move on. That just wasn't enough motivation because as I said before, my expectations of where the relationship was going to go didn't happen and it actually ended up causing, I think, hurt. But yeah, more grief. So in my mind, it was like, it was better that I didn't call him than I should have never called him because I wouldn't have to deal with anything that I'm dealing with right now, which is not what God wants, right? So we go back and do a quick review of what we learned about forgiveness. So I had to understand my need of Christ as a sinner, right? So in the beginning, God had um, intended for each of us and for myself to 
live a sin-free, happy, peaceful life, right? To live in harmony with all that he, would, he created. But Satan um, has tried to distort God's character. And of course, the whole plan of redemption went into play way before we even thought of it, before the foundation of the earth to restore us back to that, um, to restore us back to God's original plan. And we're going to do that now on earth so that we can, so that Jesus can come, right? And so, yeah, so at least I guess I can say right now that I don't think my relationship with my dad is perfect, but at least I look at him differently than I did before. I look at him as just a soul, exactly, just as much as I need a savior, right? Uh, yeah, I don't know. At least I feel a lot more at peace with that. And though our relationship hasn't gone um, the way how I thought it was, and we had like a few hiccups in between, I'm very grateful today that I still do have the opportunity to share or to talk to him uh, differently from a different perspective, because I really could have lost that opportunity, right? Uh, but now I have an opportunity to share Christ's love um, with him. And initially, at first, he wasn't very open to it. But a few weeks ago, unfortunately, his brother passed away from cancer. So now he is a lot more open to prayer and a lot more to health. So keep him in your prayers and also pray for me too. Um, but just a, qu a quick recap, right? Yes. I think that there are lots of counterfeits. And I think that in forgiveness, there's a counterfeit in forgiveness. And that we each needs to study for ourselves to understand what God has done for us and what he wants us to do for him. Uh, and we can count it all but joy to suffer as Christ suffered, right? To experience these things, because Christ has experienced all these things. He's been betrayed before and he's been hurt before. Um, so closing, he whose heart is fixed to serve God will find opportunity to witness for him. Difficulties will be powerless to hinder him who is determined to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In the strength gained by prayer and a study of the word, he will seek virtue and forsake vice. Looking to Jesus, the author and finisher of the faith, who endured the contradiction of sinners against himself, the believer will willingly brave contempt and derision and help and grace sufficient for every circumstance are promised by him whose word is truth. His everlasting arms encircle the soul that turns to him for aid. In his care, we may rest safely saying, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. Psalms 56 verse three. To all who put their trust in him, God will, will fulfill his promise. Okay, so that's pretty much the end. I am forgiven to forgive. And God is asking each of us to freely forgive as he has forgiven us. Amen? So let's close. To, let's kneel to pray. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, we want to thank you so much for your blessings for your mercy, Lord, and for the plan of redemption, Lord, to save us. And that once we do come to an understanding of you, Lord, not only to watch the plan, but to be a part of it. And I pray, Lord, that you will uh, give us a desire to consecrate our lives to you so that we'll no longer live for ourselves, but in every area of our life to live for you and to seek an opportunity to share you with all those that we come in contact with, maybe not through our words, but also through our actions. And I guess finally, I want to say thank you so much for your promise. Uh, thank you for the work that you've begun in us. And we know that, Lord, you're faithful to complete it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.